on this 24th Sunday after Pentecost. I am Sherry Shaw, Deacon and Minister of Music at I New Stay Lutheran Church in Gig Harbor, Washington. On behalf of the whole community of I New Stay, thank you for being part of our worship this morning. Our building may be closed, but the church is always open. Our worship bulletin with the order of service may be downloaded. The link is located in the box below the video that you're watching under Show More. Today we remember in prayer Cindy Beals and her family at the death of her dad, Wayne. Rest eternal grant to him, O Lord. We pray for peace and comfort for Cindy and Bob and their family. We remember in prayer Richard and Marilyn Hermstead. Both Richard and Marilyn have tested positive for COVID-19. We pray for comfort and healing for them. I invite you to turn to your bulletin as we continue our worship with the litany of repentance for complicity in racism. O oh God, we acknowledge the hold racism and prejudice have on our national psyche. Set us free from this bondage. We acknowledge that violence has been matched with violence and many are in pain and distress. Bring healing to us all. We pray now for the church in this nation, part of the body of Christ on earth, that it may be a voice of peace, reparation, and reconciliation. We stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters, all races, all skin colors, all ethnicities. We stand against racism and injustice. We stand for love. For all the ways we are complicit in perpetuating racism, Forgive us, O oh God. For all the ways we have hidden the light of Christ. Forgive us, O oh God. For all the times we have kept silent. Forgive us, O oh God. For all the times we have capitulated for fear of ridicule and retaliation. Forgive us, O oh God. For all the ways we have given over to apathy. Forgive us, O oh God. For all the ways our own prosperity has blinded us to the needs of others. Forgive us, O oh God. May God, who undid the powers of death, give us inspiration for how to move forward. May love triumph over hate. May Christ, who said upon rising from the grave, Peace be with you, bring us into God's kingdom. May peace triumph over violence. May Christ, who did not retaliate but offered forgiveness, share with us his vision. May mercy triumph over judgment. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Righteous God, our merciful Master, 
You own the earth and all its people, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. reading from Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for the day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, may we, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. 
Jesus said to his disciples, For the kingdom of heaven is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents went off and made two more talents. But the one who received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents came forward also, saying, Master, you gave to me two talents, and I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward. He said, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him. Give it to the one with ten talents. For to those who have, more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No matter how many times we hear these parables, they always have the power to disturb us. No matter what we might learn about them, the context of their cultural assumptions of the original audience or the way the parables are intended to be ironic or subversive, these parables of Jesus and Matthew always have the ability to make us cringe. Tell me you didn't squirm in your seats a little bit as you heard that story. Now, as one who has studied these parables and whom you have chosen to help you make sense of them, I could attempt to save this parable for you. I could tell you how I think it's totally faithful to read this parable with the understanding that the greedy, harsh master is actually the master of this world, seeking nothing but money and power. That the two favored servants play the master's game and do as he expects, and although they're rewarded, in the end, they only serve to enrich their master, not themselves. That the third slave, the one who refuses to enable his master's worship of wealth and instead does the honorable thing by giving the money back, that this slave maybe is Jesus, crucified outside the city uh, where it, when the sun refused to shine and where there was at least presumably some weeping and gnashing of teeth by those who loved him. I could tell you that as readers of this gospel, we know that he is vindicated on the third day, shown to be righteous, whatever that greedy master might say about it. I could give you this interpretation and make this story more palatable for you, but I won't. I won't because although I think that this is one good and faithful way to read this parable, I also don't think that that's why Matthew is telling the story in this way at this time. I think it's always our temptation to try to tame these wily parables, to domesticate them and help them, help them, help, help them serve us, make us feel more comfortable. But the simple truth is that neither these parables 
nor the God of whom they speak, are safe. In C.S. Lewis's classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you may remember that before Lucy meets Aslan for the first time, she asks her guide, Mr. Beaver, if Aslan is safe. To which Mr. Beaver replies, Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. These stories are not intended to make us feel safe. They're intended to unsettle us. They're intended to impress upon us the gravity of our situation. The prophet Zephaniah criticizes the people who say, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Those people who believe that God either doesn't care what we do while we wait for the day of the Lord, or that God is somehow unwilling or unable to save us from the very real dangers present in life. These stories are intended to disturb us to make us sit up and pay attention, to, to make our ears tingle, as the prophets would say. They're intended to remind us that the God we serve is not safe, but also that God is good. As we read Jesus' parable, we might be dismayed that it kind of sounds like God appears to be like this greedy and harsh master. But I can't help but wonder if maybe Jesus' point is that even a greedy and harsh master can reward those who are faithful. If a sinner like that could do that, how much more abundant will God's blessings be for those who are faithful to God? The stories told by Jesus and Zephaniah and Paul are all intended to remind us that the day of the Lord is coming. And that what we do while we wait for it is important. In a couple weeks, Thanksgiving is coming. And every year at this time, I, I remember uh, our first Thanksgiving year, six years ago. It was maybe our first or second week here, even in town, and our house was broken into. A thief literally came in the night. Had we known to expect him, we would have been ready. After that happened, I spent weeks lying awake thinking about how I could be ready for the next time. All of the uh, gadgets and the sensors and the alarms I could wire up and hook to my phone and whatever else to prevent another break-in. But during those weeks, I also thought about what I would have done to that thief had I caught them in the act. My thoughts were not filled with pleasant things. During those weeks after the burglary, I was made painfully aware of the darkness that lurks in my own soul. It's that darkness that clouds our sight of the day of the Lord. It blocks our vision of God's reign and allows us to see only what's in right in front of us. The fear, the anger, the pain that the world can cause us. All those things that the world can take away from us. It tempts us to place our trust in our own ability to fight evil with force or violence or to resist it with technology, to rely solely on human measures of keeping order. It's not that those things are bad, but if we place our ultimate trust in those things for peace and security in this world, we're going to be sorely disappointed when all of those things that we've come to rely on are swept away to make room for the new thing that God is doing. That darkness I saw in myself, that darkness exists in all of us. But Paul reminds us that we do not belong to that darkness, that it does not own us, we do not serve it, because we belong to the daylight, the daylight of God's reign. We have seen the seal of God's promise of redemption and salvation for all creation in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The light of God pierces the darkness so that we can see what lies ahead, so that we can perceive what is coming and prepare for it. The way of God seems like foolishness to us. It seems unable to protect us from danger and distress, from literal thieves in the night, 
But the promise of God is that day is soon coming when the world will be under God's reign, when justice and mercy and peace will be the law of the land. And when that day comes, those of us living in darkness will be dismayed as everything in which we have placed our trust, all of the, the gadgets and the gizmos, all of the threats of violence and force, all of the structures of our society, all those things are swept away. No more war, nor capitalism or communism or socialism or any other kind of ism to keep us safe and comfortable. No more threat of violence to protect us from those who would do us harm. No more will we be able to depend on our own strength or skill to gain wealth or success or comfort for ourselves. If those are the things upon which we come upon which we depend, then that day will be a day of great gloom and distress. But for those of us who belong to the day, who have seen in the faint light of Christ that this day is coming and have lived according to that faith while we have waited, the sweeping away will not be a cause for distress, but for joy. Joy because we know that even the destruction of everything we know and love is not the end of the story. It's rather the beginning of a new story, something, a story that's even better. To live as people of the day now in the midst of the night is foolishness. It can't protect us from thieves or burglars. It can't save us from madmen with guns or hostile nations with armies. It can't sweep away pandemic. It can't offer us the peace and the security we crave. And yet, Paul reminds us somewhere else that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. That true life is more than peace and security. The life that God has in store has none of these things that we've learned to depend on for our peace and our security. And yet we still trust in God's promise that that life will be one in which all tears are wiped away. A life in which death and crying and pain are no more. A life in which justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The oracles of Zephaniah and the parables of Jesus remind us that this God we serve is not safe. That when this God comes to establish this re God's reign on earth, nothing will, in all of creation will be safe from God's creative and redeeming work. For those of us who place our trust in human power structures and the work of our own hands, for those of us who choose to bury our riches in a hole in the ground in hopes that it will be safe, this is very bad news. But for those of us who belong to the day, who look with hope to see what the Lord is doing, who believe in the promise of life that God is bringing, we can rejoice in knowing that whatever death and destruction may come to us now is only a prelude to the new life which awaits us under God's reign. We risk everything when we invest all that we have in this reality that we can't even see, this reality which is not yet evident. But the promise of God is that instead of being disappointed, we will have a full return on that investment, a full return with interest to spare. That's the promise with which we support and encourage one another while we wait for the day of the Lord. And so, yeah, this parable maybe unsettles us, but maybe that's a good thing because we need to be unsettled if we're ever to look beyond the darkness that surrounds us and perceive the faintest glimpse of the dawn of the day of the Lord over the horizon.
Christ's reign to come among us. We pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, unify us across ministries, congregations, and denominations, and guide us to participate in your creative work throughout the world. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of creation, we stand in awe at the works of your hands and praise you for the beauty of nature, especially here, Mount Rainier, and the Puget Sound. Bless the earth and restore its goodness where exploitation has caused ruin. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of the nations, sound forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Increase concern for those who are most vulnerable, especially as our leaders lead uh, uh, in forging trade agree agreements and cooperate to end human rights abuses. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of all comfort, send your sustaining presence to all people of color who have been more adversely affected by the pandemic those mourning the death of loved ones, those who have lost jobs, health care, and sufficient food. Inspire the Christian community to help build a just system that equally honors and respects all lives. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Lord of all need, Search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. Bring comfort and wholeness to all, especially those we name silently or aloud. Send us encouragement and signs of your healing love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of the stranger, stir up holy, holy care in us to extend love to those at the margins. Release our desire for control and open us to learn from the perspective of others. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord of the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all the saints at rest from their labors. Guide us to live by their example, that saints yet to come may also know your love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. As we individually prepare the elements for Holy Communion in our homes, we give thanks to each of you who have contributed to the ministry of Anuste with your tithes and offerings. Thank you for your generosity. Please join me in helping our ministry be sustained and grow by following the link in the video description to donate your gift now. Even though we cannot gather physically, we can still offer our gifts together to do God's work. In our Building a Culture of Generosity video, Mike Snowden is going to share something exciting that four families in our congregation are doing to help with the stewardship campaign and with this year's budget challenges. Hi everyone, 
Today I get to talk to you about money and finances and giving to the church as part of our stewardship campaign. Did you hear those three words? I get to? I really am looking forward to talking to you today. And yes, if you had told me several months ago that I would be here today in the middle of a pandemic and all the economic upheaval it has caused, that I would really want to talk to you about these things, I would have said something like, there is no way that is going to happen. The members of Agnes Day have always been generous with their time, their talents, and with their treasure. When the membership of Agnes Day has been made aware of a need, we have always responded. For example, a few years ago, the special Above and Beyond campaign brought funds into the church that are still helping us today. Another example is the beautiful organ that we have in the front of the church. The original funds for this did not come out of the church budget, but was given by individual members who saw a need and responded. It is in this spirit of generosity I will share a story of what four of our generous families have pledged to do. As you know, we are in the middle of a stewardship campaign with the goal to stabilize giving for next year, 2021. Early this week, you should receive a letter from Pastor Seth and our council president, Beverly Buster, asking you to complete an intent card and return it to the church. It is an intent card because we are asking you to tell us what you intend to give in 2021. We understand that financial situations can change quickly in this time of pandemic, and you need to feel comfortable if an adjustment needs to be made in your giving. The goal of the Stewardship Committee is to have at least 100 intent cards filled out and returned. This is where those four families come in. As you probably know, our church is having a difficult time meeting its budget, and this campaign will not directly help with this cash flow problem. However, these four families have made a pledge in the form of a challenge gift that will bring in $4,600 to go directly to this year's budget if we as a congregation return 100 completed intent cards. All each of you have to do is prayerfully decide how much you intend to give in 2021 and put that on the intent card and return it. But wait, there's more. One of the families feels so strongly about electronic giving that they will contribute another $50 for each new family that signs up for recurring electronic giving. That could bring in another $1,000 for a total possible of $5,600 given to our budget this year. These four families were not asked directly to make these gifts. They offered to make these challenge gifts by simply hearing about what the stewardship committee needed. What these families are doing comes from a spirit of generosity, and it is in that spirit that I am asking each family to thoughtfully and prayerfully consider what they can give to Agnes Day next year and then indicate their intentional giving for 2021. No matter what kind of financial situation you are in right now, please consider how you can be generous for next year. Thank you for listening to me today. To recap, you will receive a letter with an intent card early this week. Please prayerfully and thoughtfully consider what you can give in the spirit of generosity and return the card in the addressed stamped envelope. You can also email your intent directly to Bob Nussbaum. His email address is provided in the letter. Finally, remember that you can help this year's budget by simply returning your intent card and help even more by signing up for recurring giving electronically. Thank you. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent years, you have led us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make your loving will known for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to sin and prejudice. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me.
Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Holy Spirit, and let the Church say Amen. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of resurrection, we might live in freedom and hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, O oh, glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal with us this morning, then hear these words of blessing. May the God of power and healing bless and protect you your whole life through. If you are receiving a meal with us this morning, I invite you to hear these words of promise. <clears throat> this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. In this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey, strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children, and give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. 
The Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Please join us every Sunday morning at 945 for worship and every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. to pray Vespers using Holden Evening Prayer. I invite you to visit our website, www.agnustaylutheran.org, for information on ways you can connect with some of our ministries. This week, gather Bible study, text study, prayer shawl, knitting group, and choir all meet via Zoom. Our Building a Culture of Generosity Stewardship campaign continues, and you will receive your intent card early this week. Please thoughtfully and prayerfully consider what you intend to give for 2021, and then fill out the card and return it in the stamped addressed envelope. You may also email your intent directly to Bob Nussbaum. Our fall congregational meeting follows worship today. Please join us by following the Zoom link to our regular fellowship time for this meeting. The link is on our webpage under events or at the end of the bulletin. Go in peace, Christ is with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone by making a phone call or sending a message. God bless you this week and always. Thank you.